Good afternoon, class. I'm going to talk about chapter two today. Um, the first part of chapter two, then I'll do the second part tomorrow. Um, I just want to point out two things by now, business-wise. You please register and sign up on our class list on Norton. I'm going to give an assignment next week. Um, that is a quiz on the Norton site. So a couple of you have already been in touch with me that you had some difficulty. We worked it out, so please do it again. Okay, now, a couple other things before we get into Chapter 2. All of these things are on the um, Moodle site, including talking about some definitions. And in this chapter, we really talk about the post-writing period, uh, we finished uh, the Paleolithic. We're really going to go into more of the end of the Neolithic and the Iron uh, Bronze and Iron Age. Uh, okay, and that is the dates approximately are 1200 to 500 BCE. We're also going to be moving for a while from the Middle East, from Mesopotamia and the Nile Basin into the Aegean or the what we know now as Greece, Crete, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, the first thing uh, I want to remind you to that at the beginning of each chapter is a great little synopsis of what we're studying, the timeline, uh, the chronology, and what are the objectives. So don't forget to look at those. Okay, um, in this chapter, since we're talking about those people who write now, remember writing began to develop, not terribly sophisticated, but it began to develop in approximately 1200, I'm sorry, 3200 BCE. Um, there is, we're going to be talking about two very famous historians of the ancient world in this chapter. The first is a man named Hesiod, H-E-S-O-I-D, Hesiod, Hesiod. He was a, um, he wrote in the 8th century BCE, so about 300 years um, after the main period we're talking about now. Um, he began to actually record human history. He divided, in his wisdom, human history into five ages. Uh, the first was called the Golden Age, and that was the age when men lived like gods. Everything was good for them. Food was plentiful. Work was easy. What does that sound like? It sounds like um, the dawn of civilization, and biblically, it sounds like the Garden of Eden, I believe. The second age was the Age of Silver, when men took gods for granted, killed one another, lived in dishonor. Uh, and then the gods destroyed them, um, sending a mighty flood um, <clears throat> flood that spared only the family of the son of Prometheus, who in turn built an ark. What does that sound like? Again, that sounds like a biblical Noah's Ark story. And in the story of Gilgamesh, we see the same thing. In this case, even the Greek um, gods... Um, Prometheus was the one who built an ark. Um, so that was the, we have the Golden Age, the Silver Age. That could even have been um, the age when uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt were divided against each other. Um, now, the Third Age, which we're basically approaching, and those ages were prehistory before writing. This is the age of bronze. Everything was made of bronze. Houses and armor and weapons and tools and wheels. Um, giants fought incessantly from huge strongholds, bringing destruction, uh, bringing destruction with them, um, and almost no man survives. Um, we will see if this period we're going to talk about now um, match, matches that or not. Um, <clears throat> the time following that was short, but he states very bright. It was called the Heroic Age. The Heroic Age are the times in Greek history, for example, where um, Theseus, Achilles, Odysseus, um, the Odyssey, we'll talk about that next week, um, and um, those names will be 
last forever. So we have the Golden Age, the Silver Age, um, the Bronze Age, and the Heroic Age. And the last age was the age that Hesiod lived in. He called it the Iron Age. He thought it was a dull time, a time of tedium and strife, and an understanding that people bicker and would have petty feuds. Um, just keep those frameworks of the ages of history in mind. It's interesting that he wrote them uh, sort of, you know, in the 800s, 700s, uh, when he was interpreting the history he had seen come before him. Um, now, if we actually, let's get back to what's happening on the ground. Um, and if you look at your book, either on page 40 or the PowerPoint, which uh, you can stop and start, and perhaps do it at the same time as I'm lecturing. I think that might be the best thing to do. You will see that um, in the second millennium, meaning from 2000 to 1000, um, the ancient world, if you will, was transformed by this kind of migration. And we call that a migration from the north into the Aegean. That could be, you know, Europe, Eurasia, from India, which is from uh, further east. And um, this migration, which you can see even in the Middle East, it looks like there are migrations even of Indo-Europeans and Semitic people into the Middle East. And what that creates are Indo-European languages and people. Now, uh, who are these people? And what is interesting about this, again, more cases in this chapter of modern or contemporary science influencing our understanding of history. For example, and your book points this out, it's very interesting. In 1786, a British judge who was serving in India made the discovery that really um, transformed history. He studied Sanskrit as he lived in India. And what is Sanskrit? It's the language of South Asia. His name was Sir William Jones. And he discovered, you know, the grammar, the vocabulary, truly studied it. And he studied it... Um, and he had also had some familiarity, believe it or not, with ancient Greek and Latin. And um, just, you know, by accident that people used to learn that in schools, I imagine. Um, so he was interested, he became interested in that, that um, Sanskrit actually contained some Greek, some Latin. And then he examined early German, early Celtic languages of Europe and old Persian that they found in Mesopotamia. And um, he concluded that all of these languages, what are we talking about? Sanskrit, German, Celt, Greek, Latin, um, Persia, that they all derived from the same language family. Um, and he would label that Indo-European. And we still believe that's the case. So when we look at migrations in the ancient world, we say, okay, the Indo-Europeans um, became settlers in this area and in the Mediterranean islands. Um, and that shows that the story of mankind at least even as far back as 1700, might have had something in common. Your book is kind of hokey. It says that's kind of like the Tower of Babel when everybody fell down. It was partly true. Um, since that time in, in the 1900s, etc., scholars have um, sought to understand more about history through language. Um, and it looks like uh, the Indo-European languages adopted... Um, was adopted for use in various forms throughout um, Asia, Eastern Mediterranean, etc. Um, now, about that same time from 2000 to 1700 when the Indo-European migration is taking place during the Bronze Age, right, um, we are beginning to see that a lot of these Indo-European speakers moved into your book calls it the Aegean Basin. I'm going to just call it the Mediterranean. That's Greece, Crete, and um, Cyprus, if you look at your map. Um, and we don't know, maybe other Indo-European language speakers even 
<coughs> excuse me, made it all the way to China. We don't know. But what we do know is this was a period when migration, settlement, trade, um, all the things that go along with travel and migration um, is going to have an impact on the society. Um, even on um, Anatolia. Anatolia, if you look at your map, is Turkey, what's going to become Turkey. And there, the major settlement group are called the Hittite. They were a warrior culture. They're going to last for approximately, you know, 1700 until 1500. But they do become uh, important and they become uh, a military power and are going to um, trade, bring their um, understanding and languages to the area around Turkey. Um, we're also going to see that in the Mesopotamian region, um, in the Assyrian area, there's going to be population growth, industrialization, and those Hittites, Indo-European speakers, are even going to trade uh, in that area. Um, but the Assyrians, we learn, are more traders and the Hittites more warriors. Uh, by 1700, um, many of the Hittites um, had created a large kingdom um, and they're going to capture that whole area around Turkey. Um, and this Hittite warrior um, community, if you will, um, is going to be the most formidable army of the Bronze Age. Um, new technology, horse-drawn chariots. Look on your, um, look on the um, PowerPoint. You'll see the chariots, new ways of fighting, etc. cetera. Um, and the Hittites, towards the end of their period, wanted more peace amongst all of those countries that they had dominated. They are going to use cuneiform to record their own languages, laws. Um, and of course, they also were zealous about using copper and bronze uh, to make tools and machine, you know, new technology, etc. cetera. Um, by uh, 1500, the Hittites had moved, as I said earlier, to really the Mesopotamian area towards Babylon and had sacked and captured Babylon. Uh, about 1400, about a century later, the Kassites, which are also a very new people, uh, devastated Babylon and took it. And there they presided over Babylon after getting the Hittites out of there, the Kassites, for about 500 years, bringing us to about 1,000. Um, and um, they're going to make way for even newer people. Remember, Mesopotamia is Syria and Iraq, Anatolia, Turkey, approximately. Um, and what we do know is that these Hittite influence settlers, the Mitanni, who were in Syria and Mesopotamia, made their way to the Caribbean or to the um, Mediterranean Aegean culture. Some also made their way to Egypt as well. Um, they didn't live, a, uh, their kingdom was not um, flourishing for very long, but we do know they made inroads in travel and trade. Um, I'm not going to talk about Egypt that much long, that long, but I do want to say about Egypt during the same time uh, that Egypt continued to develop, could, did trade, had trade all up and down, or I should say up and down the Nile River, uh, the pharaohs of the 18th century, the 1700s, and Egyptian civilization. This was the height of their magnificence. The rest of the area is getting new um, settlers and warring, as we know, with the Hittites, etc. But Egyptian civilization is really flourishing with the building of their temples, etc. And we know, for example, your book goes into it, the um, legacy of the power of Hatshepsut. And um, that was a period when Tutmos dynasty, his son and his successor, didn't make it, but the daughter, Hatshepsut, 
who sometimes, um, uh, you know, just, um, how do you say it? She made herself up as a man. And if you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art today, you could actually see some of these pictures of her as a man. Um, they also built shrines and mortuary palaces, uh, huge palaces that were built uh, in honor of Hatshepsut. So she was really a pharaoh um, of the 18th dynasty. She was quite powerful. Um, she governed from approximately 1480 to, you know, 1458 BCE and um, governed with her brother, um, and if you look at it carefully, um, the mother of Hatshepsut, and you'll recognize this name too, was Nefertiti, the first Nefertiti. So there's a mystery about these Egyptian pharaohs, whether men or women or the mother of uh, the pharaohs or what have you. Now, just time out. I just want to say that some people are so passionate about Egypt that they study, you know, Egyptology every part of Egypt, which is fascinating, but we're not able to take, um, you know, that much time to do it. I hope you will go to the Met at some point. I think it's reopened now. Um, and you can actually go, you can see Pyramid in the Metropolitan Museum that was brought from Egypt there. You can see Hatshepsut's sculpture, the ones you see in the book. Uh, you can see the sculptures of Hatshepsut and her father, Tutmos, um, if you look on page 44 and 45. Um, what I will say about Egypt at that time is that um, because they were so wealthy, they had begun to trade. They even traded in the um, north of Africa or largely south Upper Egypt, which is what we call Nubia, and today that's Sudan and Ethiopia. Um, and that was called the Hindu Kush region. And Kush in Semitic languages means black. So we assume also through the study of language that that is the African, northern African um, migration. Um, Akhenaten, the important um, pharaoh in the 1300s, you can see on the next pages, um, on page 46, which I'm not going to go into too much, the use of color on the friezes, on the sculptures, on the storytelling. And you can see the throne. You could, you know, use the same, what do you see? What might it tell us? What are you looking at? Um, and so from about 1300 to um, and on with the memorizing or memorializing of Akhenaten, you can see gold, silver being used, and color um, in the images of Akhenaten and then his son, who I bet most of you have heard from, uh, Tutankhamun uh, and Tutankhaten. And he becomes the boy king, the son of them, who I'm sure you've heard of, Tutankhamun, from about 1333 to 1324. Um, and he's succeeded, and the pharaohs keep going down, all the way to Ramses, who founds uh, the 19th century and is going to restore Egypt to its unified glory. In fact, um, Egypt is probably the one civilization that has remained united except for something like 40 years during the reign of the Hyksos when they take over and that was actually probably accidental um, so and they are still a united country now so let me stop here I'm going to make I guess three lectures of this then I'll come back and talk about um, the late Bronze Age trading networks and the very mysterious peoples that invade the Aegean uh, in a bit.